I want to start with a little exercise this morning. No, I'm not going to make you get up and run through the aisles. I know Skip is already back there. He's ready for his cali morning calisthenics. Good for you, Skip. Not all of us have your same energy. <laughs> but I want you to think this morning of someone that you love. Have that person's face or their name come into your mind. Now, take a moment, you have that person, take a moment and think about why you love them. Why do you love this person? Now, give me a nod of affirmation so I know it's not just me. If you thought, I love this person because of what they do for you or for others. Is that part of it? What they do is part of what makes you love them as much as you do? Maybe a few of you. Maybe it's not just me. OK, good. Right, this is how we tend to think in our world. We love someone or something because of how they make us feel. They earn our love. They are worthy of our love in some ways based on what they do for us. And so it's worth noting this morning that our scriptures, as so many others do, tell us that, that God's love moves in the opposite direction. That God's love is counterintuitive. It's, it's countercultural to the way that we, in our world, the dominant stream of what we assume about love to be as a society. Our story this morning of Jesus' baptism from the Gospel of Luke comes, chronologically speaking, before Jesus has done anything significant. It's the story that immediately follows the passage we just read last week, which was Jesus, the boy at the temple, having run away from his family and left them to clean up for themselves and them to journey on for a full day before realizing that he's gone. Right? He's not yet begun his ministry, which means he has no disciples, no followers. He's still formulating his beliefs and his message. He hasn't tried it out yet. He's not had any major audiences. He's not yet performed any miracles or healings. He's not yet clashed with the religious or political leaders, as he will do. No one, save his family and friends, really knows anything about this guy at this point. And they, for the most part, probably know him and his humanness all too well to go around calling him the Messiah, the Christ, God's chosen one. And in fact, this is exactly what happens in Jesus' first public appearance a chapter later. Isn't this just one of Joseph's sons? The villagers are murmuring to themselves. Why are we here to listen to him? What's so special about him? Like them, it's, it's all too easy for us to overlook someone until they, they do something that we deem special, something extraordinary. Well, then we'd love to be in their company. Before Jesus has really done anything for God, before he has done anything to prove himself, to prove his worthiness. Before he has done anything to make daddy proud or prove that he loves God so much that he will count the cost and follow God to the end, no matter what, before all of that, the skies break open and a voice echoes through the clouds, this is my son, my child, my beloved. I am so well pleased with this one. I'm emphasizing this this morning because I think that for the most part, those of us who claim to follow Jesus and worship the God that he reveals to us have largely only paid this notion lip service. But it's as simple as it might seem, it's foundational and as I want to say this morning, quite revolutionary. You could argue that there is no Christianity apart from this claim. 
Because apart from it, you cannot talk about grace, which by its very nature is something that is unearned. It is freely given. And just as God's love shook the earth for Jesus, so does God's love for each of God's children. The gospel, the good news of God revealed in Jesus, whom we proclaim to be the Christ, is that God doesn't love us for what we do or who we might become. God loves us not because we become successful or because we've earned it. We've gotten those gold stars. We've gotten enough of them to earn up our points and get that crown in heaven. God loves us not because we've proven ourselves to be good enough. God's love, God's affirmation of each of our dignity is simply our birthright. As the waters of the womb break open in birth, a voice from heaven declares, this is my beloved child with whom I am so well pleased. You can hear the delight that God takes God's love is ours, and as the Apostle Paul goes on to so elegantly put it to those early followers in Rome, those people who were experiencing divisions and conflict and persecution, as we heard in that passage, by famine, by sword, just the, the, the common sufferings of life, the hardships of life, not to mention those that are thrust upon us through injustice by those in power, he says, nothing can separate us from this love of God. Nothing in this life we do or don't do, no suffering, no dehumanizing policies, no church's judgment or exclusion, no Christian or pastor's prejudice wrapped up in half-baked theology, nothing, not even death, can separate us from the love that God has for us. Let the people say amen. Which means that God's love, God's declaration of infinite worth is no less for those who've lied or stolen or murdered than for those who haven't. Which means that God's affirmation of beauty and belovedness is no less for the transgender child than it is for the heterosexual cisgender child. God's love is no less for God's, God's no less well pleased with the refugee or the undocumented than it is for those with papers or those living securely in the borders in which they were born. God's love is no less for the person that you despise than it is for you. Because God's love is not earned. And therefore, it cannot be taken away or diminished. And God's affirmation of our being, God's desire for our flourishing will resist any voice or action, any policy that insists otherwise. We call this grace. And if it doesn't make you at least a little uncomfortable, a little squeamish, well, then you, we might not have let ourselves really hear the gospel. I know it makes me a little uncomfortable to preach it goes against everything in so many ways that we are raised to believe about who is worthy, <clears throat> whose lives have value, who is important. And this fall, I was approached by an, a new family about performing a baptism. And in my mind, I had this whole plan for this Sunday. I was going to have this sermon on baptism, and then I was going to perform this baptism, and I can't tell you how much I was looking forward to that. And then we were going to have our annual meeting after worship and talk about what it means to be not just a baby baptized into community, but to be a part of that community.
community and the ministry that God is doing through us. It was going to be great. I had it all worked out. And then I was reminded, as I so often am, of what happens when you tell God what your plans are. I have so many good ideas that God upends. Just ask me. I'll tell you. The point is that we make this same declaration when we baptize newborns or young children, right? Their whole lives, we pray, are ahead of them. Before they've ever done anything noteworthy, before they've made us proud, indeed knowing that they will talk back, that they will push all of our buttons and then some, before knowing how their lives will play out, which directions they will take, which choice is good or bad, a good number of both to be sure that they will make, we perform this ritual as a way of proclaiming God's unshakable love over them. And we pray that day after day that they will continue to hear this promise whenever they are in need of it, whenever they are feeling like the world is telling them that they don't measure up. See, baptism is not a ritual that gets us into heaven or through which we earn God's favor. And yes, the babies look cute, all donned in white, but we don't do it for the fun of it. Baptism is a way of reminding ourselves of this birthright of belovedness with whom God is well pleased, that we all too easily lose sight of for ourselves and for others as the years wear on. How often do we not struggle to believe this promise for ourselves, to let it define us rather than what others say of us? We struggle with those demons in our heads telling us that we are not worthy of love struggle with comparing ourselves to others and feeling like we're, we're not good enough, we'll never measure up, or, or on the other side, that we are so much better than all those idiots over there. Or we feel that if people really knew who we were, the mistakes that we've made, those things we keep in the shadows of our minds and hearts, that they would definitely reject us. God would definitely reject us. And so one more exercise. Take a moment and think of something that you have done, something for which you are ashamed that you have carried with you like a weight on your shoulders, something for which you've never forgiven yourself, or something that you you dislike or even hate about yourself that makes you feel unworthy of God's love. Now let me say it one more time. Nothing can separate you from the love that God has for us, has for you everyone else. Is it hitting you yet? Is the absurdity of this love, the counterintuitive, countercultural nature of it, penetrating those thick walls that you, perhaps like me, have built up around your heart to protect it? I'm spending so much time this morning emphasizing this simple point because in a society that thinks you more or less get what you deserve, and that your value again corresponds to this, the gospel is profoundly counter-cultural. And so as soon as we leave this sanctuary, we, like Jesus, who is thrust out into the wilderness immediately following his baptism, we will find ourselves inundated with the voices of pundits and preachers and Uncle Steve's who will try to tear down this promise of God who will insist over and over again that 
that one does have to prove themselves worthy of belonging, that they deserve to be here, that one is worthy. For how else could we have a society that justifies locking up millions of people behind bars, many of whom were born into the dead end of poverty in communities that were over-policed and underinvested in, many of whom were wrongfully convicted for minor drug offenses, which we have now made legal. How else could we continue to support, allow the death penalty to separate families seeking asylum? How else could we call the bombing of a wedding in Pakistan collateral damage? That is, we distort our divine inheritance when we use it to justify actions or policies that exclude or demonize or kill. We distort our divine inheritance by thinking that it makes us more special than those people, whomever we deem those people to be. But the irrevocable promise of God's love, which forms the foundation of all Christian theology and living, is revolutionary because as scripture makes clear over and over again, God's love isn't just for a select in-group. It is universal. God desires the flourishing not just of this community or of our community, but of all of God's children. And to act in a way that denies the belovedness of anyone, to justify anyone's exclusion, is to betray the promises that we declare at our baptism. If, as Jesus says elsewhere, a tree is known by its fruits, such actions, such justifications make clear that the gospel hasn't fully penetrated our hearts. And as John says, Jesus has come to sift and winnow, to separate the wheat from the chaff. If we think that we are better than others, our nation is better than others, then we've lost the humility that is required to experience God's transforming love. God's love is revolutionary in the end because we cannot experience it for ourselves without being so transformed that we end up lavishing it on others. No doubt we continue to make mistakes and screw up and bumble along the way we're human. But to go on seeking justifications to exclude some, to go on emphasizing my, my right to do as I please over my Christian calling to consider how loving my neighbor might mean doing something that I don't want to do. I don't find convenient to go on doing such things while speaking of God's love is a contradiction in terms. Rather, when the waters of baptism, the waters of God's love have penetrated our hearts, we find ourselves instead asking, what love would ask of me? Even when and where it is inconvenient. Even when and where it's not what I want to do. Even if it costs me something. That, that is the revolutionary nature of God's love, of what it does to us and thereby to our world in its natural outworking. May we, may we like Jesus allow ourselves to be transfigured by those waters and by the light of God's love, and indeed with us, all the world.
May it be so.